Sarah, an important part of my beach or pool plan used to be making sure I had a swim cover up on hand. But it turns out it's actually pretty uncomfortable to try to squeeze cut off shorts over a wet swimsuit. But when I'm wearing my new swimsuit from our sponsor, Miracle Suit, I'm just way more confident relaxing in my suit. So if I have to get up to get a snack or a drink or whatever, it's no big deal. Yeah, Megan, I'm so comfortable in my Miracle Suit too. And I'm glad we get to talk more about how much we are loving these swimsuits. So I got the Luminaire Cherie One Piece and I love this proprietary Miratex fabric. It is truly like a firm hug. But have we talked about how cute this style is? It kind of has a retro vibe. It's navy blue with white polka dots and has a little sweetheart neckline. So cute. Oh my gosh, that sounds adorable. You know, all of Miracle Suit styles are beautiful and they're all about that famous fit. Whether you want to accentuate your curves, support your tummy, or complement your long torso, Miracle Suit has a fit for you. Listeners, we know you'll love Miracle Suit as much as we do, and there's still time to order yours for this summer. We have a special offer just for our listeners. Go to MiracleSuit.com today and order with our exclusive code MOMHOUR to get 25% off. That's such a good deal. Don't wait. Save 25% now with code MOMHOUR at MiracleSuit.com. Megan, it has been such a full summer for us already. And one of the highlights was our big family trip to Switzerland and Italy. We were gone for two weeks and it was amazing. But when we got home, all I wanted to do was kind of like re-nest into my home. I'm a homebody anyway, and I love having a space where we can all feel really comfortable, especially after travel, which is why I'm so excited to welcome our new sponsor, Wayfair. Wayfair is the ultimate online home store. Yeah, Sarah, I have been doing a little browsing on the Wayfair site, and you know how I've told you a few times that Eric's design style prior to me moving in was rather manly yes, and like a lodge? So I've been looking at getting a new rug to kind of add a little feminine kick in our living room. So I've got my eye on the Sonia machine washable oriental rug. It's kind of that faded look that I think is so pretty and it's washable, which I love. Oh my gosh, that's so great. I also love when you search on Wayfair, how specific you can get with say dimensions for a rug or a piece of furniture or what material you're looking for or your price range. I find the searchability so easy to use on Wayfair. It's the best place to find anything you want for your home, no matter your style or budget. So whether you're refreshing a tired room in your house or helping a college kid set up their dorm, Wayfair has you covered. It's good to come home when you live in the Waberhood. Visit Wayfair.com or download the Wayfair app. That's W-A-Y-F-A-I-R.com. Wayfair, every style, every home. Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us, and we're the hosts of The Mom Hour. On this show, we're joined by a team of unique mom voices from across the country and in different stages of motherhood to bring you tips, ideas, and encouragement, and to help you feel a little less alone. We all know that motherhood is a lot easier when real moms share honest truths and remind each other that it's all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to The Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 477 of The Mom Hour. I'm Megan Francis here with Sarah Powers. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Megan. Welcome back. We are back. Um, Just like don't know what we're doing exactly. Always. Always a little bit. (laughs) We always don't know what we're doing, but right now we really don't because how many weeks has it actually been since we've sat down and recorded together? Well, yeah, and this is where we pull back the curtain, right? Because the listeners haven't heard a new Megan and Sarah episode for six weeks. So the podcast, we took a podcast uh, airing production break for six weeks, but that's not, doesn't match up exactly with. Like we're not doing this in real time, people. Right, exactly. (laughs) It doesn't match up exactly. I want to say that it's actually pretty close. I think we took five weeks off of recording because of when we we got a bunch done before the end of the school year, before my family um, went overseas for two weeks. So even though the timing isn't exactly the same, I think it's been about five weeks since we've done this and we are rusty. So everyone just come on, grab a drink, everyone. (laughs) Just (laughs) reacquaint yourselves with us. Yes. Well, and I also, you know, you and I have been really busy. So there's things that we we know what vaguely has been on each other's plate, but we really haven't done a deep dive catch up on all things summer because we've both been living. We've both been doing summer. Yeah. Yeah. This will be fun. We'll just get to catch up with each other and have all of you along for the ride. I hope everyone has been listening the last six weeks to the episodes that have been dropping every Tuesday 
Um, we had Jamie and Joanna from our contributor team kind of take the lead, but they also then brought on guests and other contributors from our team. So if you have missed a few of the recent episodes of the Mom Hour, I highly recommend going back and listening. There's topics that they're able to cover from personal experience that you and I, Megan, just aren't experiencing anymore. anymore. There's yeah. also some really um, important, vulnerable mental health conversations, um, NICU conversations, just stuff that I feel so grateful that we have moms who are um, willing to talk about some topics and then also just that have some personal connection to these topics that you and I maybe don't have. So yeah. really, really great episodes and so thankful for our team for the last, for just giving us a break, I guess, but also bringing such important conversations to the community. Yes. Thank you to Jamie and Joanna, but also good job to them yeah. and everybody else they had on. They really did a great job. Um, and I have enjoyed listening. It's kind of fun to listen to our podcast with neither one of us in it and yeah. just be like, wow, this is so great. I like listening to this. So very good. Very good. Yeah, I totally agree. I feel very thankful and proud of them and everybody go listen. So we have a lot to catch up about today, but I was thinking about this, Megan. This feels like an episode where I want us to maybe have a beverage that we're sipping while we chat. And maybe the listeners want to get a summer beverage wherever you are, unless you're driving or on a jog or something. So let's start with a very silly beverage question. I want to know what is summer 2024 so far in beverages for you? Do you have a signature drink this summer? Is there like one that's like at the top of the list for the, the drink of the summer? You know, I, I don't vary or I guess veer off path that much. Even in the summer, I still drink my tea hot and I still drink my wine red for the most part, you yeah. know, with, a, with occasional rosé. But if I had to pick like the summer MVP, it has been um, non-alcoholic beer. Here's okay. why. I really like the flavor of a beer. But if I have a beer in the middle of the day, which is kind of when I usually want one, I get so sleepy afterward. Yep. Like I just want to go curl up and take a nap. So I haven't been doing that. And I've also just not been not drinking as much wine. So it's like an N.A. beer is kind of perfect because it has that bitter adult taste. I think an N.A. beer tastes almost just like a regular beer. Like to me, unless you like a really thick, you know, um, like English style ale or something, I don't know that they can do that. But the kind of beer that I typically drink is on the lighter side anyway. And if it's like four o'clock or three o'clock and I'm like, I want something that feels kind of adult and special, but I'm not ready for the evening yet. And I don't want to go take a nap. It, it hits the mark every time. So okay. the two that I've really been drinking a lot are um, a brand called Partake. I think it's a Canadian brand. I really like their blonde ale and they are uh, that I can only get at one place in town and sometimes they're out. So it's not super easy to find in my town, but I, I can find it sometimes. And then athletic brewing, which is everywhere now yep. I can get that in the upper peninsula. I can get everywhere. They have a golden ale that I like quite a lot. So this is like the, the second time I've heard you talk about this and I'm so intrigued and I haven't, I haven't partaken yet, but I actually have a couple of those athletic brewing, um, NA beers in our fridge. Someone brought them over for a gathering and then left them. And I, I think this afternoon, I just need just to try it. There's Why no not? reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I love that. Well, what, um, is top of mind for me is ever since getting back from our big trip, which I'll talk about. Um, I am back in my summer routine of an afternoon cold brew coffee. Um, long time listeners know I'm very ritualistic. I always have hot coffee in the morning and I always have one coffee in the afternoon and I only do iced when it's like truly, truly summer. Um, and I've been making my own cold brew coffee for a few years with the same, um, I, I guess it's a device. It is not, a, you do not plug it in, but it is a cold brew coffee maker. It's the OXO, the OXO brand. And I will, okay, I've yep. talked about it before and I can link to it again. Um, so you make it the night before, but it makes a concentrate, like a cold brew concentrate that then stays in the fridge. And it even has the little, like, looks like a beaker, like a, like a, something you'd use in a chemistry lab okay. beaker. And you keep that in the fridge and it will make, if it's just me having the afternoon cold brew, it'll last me like more than a week because it's really concentrated and you're just using a little bit. So I use a little bit of the concentrate add a little bit of water and then a little bit of oat milk. And I even have fun ice cubes, like ice cubes from like a fun ice cube tray where they're just these like nice, perfect little cubes. And I usually have it in 
Um, I have a couple different tumblers or glasses, um, maybe with like a bamboo straw. It's just a very like summer ritualistic mm. cold coffee thing. And I've been doing it since we got home and I love it. That does sound delightful. I'm going to say that the runner up for me, 2024 summer, <laughs> speaking of your non-alcoholic beer, was when we were in Europe for two weeks, I had a beer at lunch, I think every single day. And it was so delightful. And then, as you suggest, it makes you sleepy. And sometimes I did take a nap in the afternoon. So I'm going to say that lunchtime beer of the of the alcoholic variety um, is also a signature summer drink for me. But I am no longer doing that daily now that I am home from vacation. Well, I would also say that when you're on vacation, all bets are off. And you certainly can have any kind of beverage at any time of the day, morning, noon, yeah. night, whatever, because you're not you're not going to go work, you know. No. Well, yeah. hopefully not. You're on vacation. So, yeah. hey, I want to say something about coffee really quick. Yeah. This is only very tangentially about coffee, but you know, I'm not a coffee drinker. I, I like the smell. Otherwise, don't care for it. Right. Um, but yesterday, Eric and I were out and he was jonesing for some ice cream. And, you know, I also don't care about ice cream. Like I, I've talked, we've talked about this, right? Yeah. Like I'll, I'll eat ice cream, you know? Yes. Like once a summer, maybe I, I just, it's good. I just don't care about it. I never crave it. Right whatever. So he was pretty insistent that, that we share an ice cream and I was like, fine, whatever. So I didn't even go in with him <laughs> sat in the car and he went in and got ice cream. And he came out with this enormous cappuccino ice cream with like chunks of chocolate in it. Okay. It was so good. It was. You loved so it. he had actually gotten two scoops and he thought I would just want regular chocolate, but they put it in this cup. So the chocolate scoop was all the way at the bottom. So we uh -huh. had to like eat through the all of the cappuccino ice cream to get to the chocolate ice cream. And at first I thought I'll just let him eat it, but I had a bite and it was like, Oh my gosh, this is so good that I ended up eating a whole bunch of it. Then I got to the chocolate and was like, eh, it wasn't very good by comparison. There was something about that bitter roasty flavor yeah. in an ice cream with the chocolate chunks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was real good. I love coffee, ice cream, coffee, flavored ice cream, coffee, chip, um, I ate it. It was kind of my go-to flavor in my late teens through, I don't know, my 20s. Not that I was eating ice cream all the time, but when I did, that was what I went for. And I, I think, does that ever happen to you with a flavor where you're like, I think I'm just done. Just Not that it. I don't yep. like it, but I just don't ever order it anymore. If it was in front of me, I would for sure have a few bites and probably find it delicious. But I think I want my coffee in a beverage and my ice cream to be chocolate or cookies and cream or any other number of ice cream flavors. You know, Sarah, I've noticed we're both a little suspicious of products that seem too good to be true. Like I'm not above Googling reviews and checking labels to make sure things are legit. And don't get me wrong. I actually think this is a good thing that helps us from wasting money on products that don't work. For all our listeners who are also skeptics, our sponsor Ritual might be the multivitamin for you. Yeah, that's right, Megan. Ritual believes that multivitamins should have tough standards to back up their claims. Their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin has high quality, traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And get this, Ritual is USP verified, which is a designation that only about 1% of supplement brands on the market have. USP verified means that the product contains the ingredients actually listed on the label. So there's no guessing what you're putting in your body. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 25% off your first month at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 25% off. Okay, Megan, pop quiz. Tell me what these things have in common. Sweatshirts, lunchboxes, water bottles, school supplies. Um, okay, Sarah, I think those would all be things my kids have lost over the years. <laughs> right. Close. Very close. They're all things that could use a label from our sponsor, Name Bubbles. Name Bubbles makes custom name labels for all our kids' stuff. They're dishwasher safe and won't fall off in the washing machine. They have iron-on versions and stick-on versions in every size and every style. Basically, if you can dream up a label, Name Bubbles has it. Yeah, Sarah, name bubbles are great for kids of all ages, and they come in handy for more than just school supplies. They have allergy labels, contact info labels, and write-on labels that are perfect for baby bottles or sippy cups. And right now, we have a really good deal for our listeners who are ready to stock up. 
Go to namebubbles.com to order name bubbles for your family. Use code MOMHOUR for 25% off your entire order. That's N A M E B U B B L E S dot com and use code MOMHOUR for 25% off. Megan, is it too early to start thinking about fall? Ugh, my heart says yes, but my brain says no. Now is the time to start thinking, or at least thinking about thinking. Well, how about dreaming about fall shoes? That's way more fun, right? You know, our longtime sponsor, Vionic, has the best styles for everyday wear to get us ready for the season. And I'm ready to add some new ones to my collection. One style I have my eye on is the Winnie sneaker. It's a white leather sneaker in this really sophisticated style that I feel like would complement any outfit. Yeah, Sarah, those Winnie sneakers are so cute. And because they're made with Vionic's exclusive Viomotion technology, you know they're going to be crazy comfortable too. Vionic shoes are great for anything from running errands to clocking miles at a theme park. And they're clinically proven to help with foot troubles like plantar fasciitis and heel pain. Listeners, if you're ready to try Vionic shoes, use code THEMOMHOUR15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at bionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one-time use only code. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. All right, Megan, so let's just um, chat and catch up with the listeners about our summers. Um, you share a little bit sometimes um, on social media or in your Substack. So I I read your Substack like a like a reader, like a fan sometimes when I haven't Ooh. caught up with you. But I say that only because if people want more details, there's definitely more backstory on your summer at least. But why don't you start by telling everyone about the retail brand you started this summer? Yeah, that's the thing. That's okay, like, so first like of all, a, that's not just a small thing. No, it's not, and it's nothing like I've ever done before. So. Um, first of all, I know we teased that this was going to be happening in the last episode we did before. Yeah. Or yeah. Mm -hmm. I just don't remember exactly how much we said. And I also did a whole episode about it on the tease made. So if you wanted to like do the deep dive of the episode is called, I started a tea shop, I think, or yeah, I started a tea shop. So I started a tea shop. (laughs) <laughs> like a physical, and, like yes. a physical store. So, you know, I have the market up in the upper peninsula that used to be just a bookstore. And then we expanded this summer into a multi vendor, you know, like a public market. And my little store is a tea shop with like sort of a side, um, like a micro brand inside of that or a micro shop that is craft supplies. But I'm really focusing on the tea and it's called Bevy. And that is kind of a play on a group of birds and also a beverage. And I, we launched that back in June. So that, yeah. yeah, So that has been in effect for gosh, like over a month now, well, about a month and a half by the time this, you know, the, by the time this airs and Eric and I have gone up twice to work it. We went up for like 10 days over the 4th of July holiday. And then there's like a, a town festival the week after. So that's a really busy time up there and worked in the store and it's doing really well. Like there's a, an interest I wouldn't necessarily have expected in a small town in like good tea. I love it. Um, but also tea wear and tea gifts and things like that as well. I think when we did talk about it before, if I remember right, you know, the idea and the branding and even the setup was there, but talk about like actually having customers, like, like people wandering in who you didn't have a store there and now you do. Yeah. And you are the proprietress. Yes. Was that fun? It was so fun. It was, and it was really, what was really, really fun about that particular week is that a lot of the same people, like people who grew up there and then come back every year, a lot of them seem to come back around that time. So we had so many people walking in and a, just being like, I remember when this was nothing, or I remember when this was a five and dime 50 years ago or whatever. So that was fun to reminisce. But then to see people really appreciate how unique the store is and how, what a selection of things we have. Um, and yes, of course, for people to, to meet other tea drinkers was really fun and to talk about tea with people was really fun. Overall, it was just a really, it was just a lot of fun. I, I like feel retail. out of your um, depth? Like, did you have anybody come in and like ask really technical tea questions or like, um, did you ever have any like imposter syndrome at all? No, you know, I think that maybe I might have if it was set up, you know, there's those tea shops where you go in and like the tea is all in bulk right? and you're yeah. sort of measuring it out. And 
in those cases, I think there's just an expectation you're going to have like a lot of knowledge of tea, but this was not that. The people are coming in to buy cute canisters of good tea. I mean, it's yummy stuff, but I didn't have to know much beyond does this have caffeine in it or not? Right. You right. know, does this, well, somebody did come in and I happened to be upstairs um, in my sister and her husband's apartment. And she came running up and said, somebody wants to know if there's um, BPA or what the tea bags are made out of. Cause I had, uh, I have one brand or maybe two that they, most of it's loose leaf, but a couple of them do come in with bags. And I said, well, I can't exactly remember off the top of my head, this brand, but you can tell her, I think, maybe I was in the bathroom. I don't remember. I said, you can tell her there's no BPA. I know that for sure. They're not like plastic bags. Yeah. They're, um, there's some of them are silk and some of them are made from this like uh, compostable like cornstarch. Okay. And I just couldn't remember which one was which, but I said, you could tell her for sure there's no BPA. And you can also just quickly like search the brand. So anyway, that was a moment of like, oh my gosh, what are they made of? But I remembered, like, I already thought about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I had already given that thought before I ever put anything out on the floor. And I don't have a ton of, of stock. I think I've got maybe five T brands and it's not like I have so many, um, different pieces of inventory that I have to worry a lot about, like, I don't know, losing track of what I have or not right. remembering what I bought. It's not really like that. So it's been fun to see the stuff that people want, like on the craft supply side, the stuff that's going fast. I got some hand, um, hand dyed yarns from oh, neat. Um, a Northern person who named them after the area, like uh -huh. the forest and the lake up there and stuff like that. And it was just fun to see like this. And I kind of thought this is really expensive. I'm not sure people are going to buy it, but it, sells people yeah. like it so yeah. you just it, it's it's fun to just see it happening in real time yeah and to see people's excitement and um I can't wait to be there a little longer I think maybe there's going to be opportunities maybe when the summer you know when the summer rush calms down and it's more locals to have like a tea tasting or something like that so that's all down the road so cool so so yeah. cool well, like we said, there's places to hear more about that, like on your podcast. And so we'll link those up in the show notes. But let's uh, move on and talk about the other thing you did in the first half of the summer, which was finish your manuscript. Yes, I did. And um, as of this recording, that is still underway. So I did turn in a book. Now, here's the funny thing. I, I had been getting up and just writing first thing in the morning. That was sort of how I decided if I'm going to get this book done, I just have to not let myself get distracted by other things. I can't let myself get into other things I'm thinking about. Like this just has to be when my mind is fresh, I just have to jump in. So I had been doing that for about six weeks, but I finished it up the week I was up there running the store too. So like <laughs> I would get up in the morning, the store didn't open until 10. I would, um, Eric would go down because he wanted to like get the coffee going and be, you know, he, he likes it even more than me. I think, um, he's puttering around and I'm like up in the bedroom, just hammering away on my manuscript and had to turn it in July 8th, the morning of, and I wanted to take Clara to the zoo that afternoon. So I was like, at some point you just have to turn it in. I, yeah. I was, I, I thought that morning, oh man, if only I had three more hours, um, I wouldn't have to like turn this in or, you know, I could, if I didn't yeah. have to go to the zoo, I could just I could just give this a little more time. And then I thought, no, I'm, I'm exhausted. Like yeah, mentally, I can't cut do, off. Yeah. I need a cutoff and I need some feedback. Like yeah. I need my editor to tell me something. So I just turned in what I had and then she turned around the edits four days later. So this was a Monday <laughs> morning. Was too fast. Like, I, need she, a I, know, I was like, I can't this. even read a book that fast. And right. I also thought it, my sister was like, it must feel like a huge relief. Like, and I said, it is, but it's like a relief where, you know, it's going to come back. <laughs> like it's like such a short term relief because yeah. you don't actually know what's going to happen in the editing process. So there's like an anxious right. relief. Yeah. It's not, it's not the full, like full body release. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So she got back to me that Friday afternoon. So five days later with edits that were mostly like mostly structural. I was not surprised. Like I knew exactly what she was going to criticize, but I needed her to do Yep. I needed her to tell me, not for me to guess. So now we're in the process of doing the edits and it's going really well. Um, and it's just, it's such a good reminder that like anything this big, anything as big as writing a 70,000 word book um, or something similar, you know, yep. <laughs> like writing a, a com 
uh, like composing a long, an opera, let's say, whatever yeah. it is. There's going to be many moments where you're like, there's no possible way. Yeah. This yeah. doesn't, this isn't even a thing. This has no shape. It's just a yeah. blob. It's just ideas. And then you just whittle away and yep. you whittle away. And soon enough, it's like, oh, well, this is a thing now. And maybe if I give it to someone else and they help me shape it, then when it comes back to me, I can make it into even more of a thing. And I, I can so quickly forget that, even though I know better. Um, I often read the acknowledgement sections. I read a lot of nonfiction books, um, but but even in fiction, there is a there's an acknowledgements, a thank you section yeah. at the end. And I made a habit years and years and years ago of I. I almost, I almost never skip it. I always read it. It's what is it's two more pages when you're already done with a book. And so I feel like I have such a, like a by proxy appreciation for that process because the author is all always so obviously appreciative of the different people along the way who take it, like you said, from this kind of amorphous blob to the next step. And I feel like I've learned a lot about actually like the the publishing process just by reading like first it was this and then right. my editor and then helped I, shape and then, it and then the marketing team. <laughs> and then team I and, despaired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 So have you ever, I was thinking about the other books you've written. Have you always had a deadline, like a manuscript deadline like this? Or have you ever had to like, had to work on a manuscript until you thought it was done and then send it out. I know people who write fiction, you kind of have to finish your novel and then Which ship it hard, out. I mean, that I'm would be so hard person. Yeah. I like a deadline. Yeah, um, every book I've ever written has been like this yeah. where I've had a deadline. Yeah. And in some cases, my deadline has been a lot tighter, but in those cases, the book was structurally easier to write, like more formulaic mm-hmm. or more like all how to, I'm really good at hammering out service, um, how to kind of stuff. Right. It's a lot harder when you're when you're trying to make something where there is no model. It's not even like I could go, you know, pick another book off the bookstore shelf and look at it and go, oh, this is what I'm trying to do. Because I really I was sort of making it up. Yeah. So, well, uh, that's yeah. a good um, for those who have forgotten or haven't heard. This is kind of like a hybrid memoir slash parenting teens and young adults book. Question yeah, mark. So like, it's not like it's not exactly memoir because it's not like it takes me through at this, like a time period, Mm -hmm. like a memoir often is very story driven, but there's a lot of personal, like first person narrative perspective. And I'm trying to remember how I've, I've heard a a phrase recently that I thought was really indicative, like a teaching memoir or something where there's like lot, it's more, it's like a narrative nonfiction slash essay slash there's, but there's prescriptive advice in it Mm -hmm. and tips too. So it's, and research, it's all kind of, you know, it's like, you know, it when you see it, Mm -hmm but it's not always easy to exactly describe. (laughs) So, well, I'm just, I'm just high-fiving you. That is, that is a big deal to have turned that in. I'm high-fiving myself. Here I go. In the summer. Yes. (laughs) Um, Well, anything else about summer so far that you want to share? Um, Well, let's see. The only two kids that are still home are uh, Owen and Clara. And Clara finished up um, segment one of driver's ed. So in Michigan, that means she did the book learning. Okay. She passed her first test. She starts doing drives with the driver's ed person. You know, the one that has the brake, um, on their side of the car. Mm -hmm. She starts that soon. She and I did go out and drove up and down our driveway the other day, just so she could kind of get a feel Uh for how that feels. And it's kind of funny because we actually went out, we live on a dead end, like a um, dead end road that has like a little, um, circular thing at the end. So you can kind of easily whip around like a turnaround, you know? Um, but nobody lives down at that end. And so we were driving up and down that street and I'm like, I think this is actually illegal, but what are you supposed to do? She was terrified. So, you know, you got to learn how to drive somehow. Yeah. You do. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she's about to start doing that. Um, Owen got a a job at dollar general. It has been hilarious to have him in retail. I feel like there's probably some stories that Oh, goodness gracious. Yes. But the funniest ones to me are honestly the ones where he is so surprised that like management doesn't take the training videos seriously. (laughs) He would be like, clearly we were told in the training video that we're not supposed to sell to someone who's going to buy for someone else, like, you know, alcohol or or tobacco. And he's like, but then I tried to get my manager involved. They wouldn't do anything. And I said, oh, honey, that's corporate yeah they care but your manager doesn't care your like manager's your manager's 19 oh, and you're 18 right? it's like <laughs> if you waited about long enough you could be the manager like in a couple of months so 
it's just so funny because it's like it's such this is why kids have these jobs. Yep. Because you mm-hmm. have to learn mm-hmm. um that this is how the world works. Like yep. that there will be people in a position of authority who don't follow the rules. And what do you do with that? Like what do you do when that happens? Yep. And what do you do? And it's just it's such a fun learning experience. And he's just often just flummoxed. I love it. I love it so much. And Clara did not end up getting a job. I think when we talked about our our kids and what they were up to, we lamented the 15-year-old yeah. summer. Did she end up getting a job? She didn't. But, you know, she was up in the UP with me for almost two weeks. And she did work in our store. Yeah. Um, so I paid her for that. And she did a, she did great. Like, yeah. she's very friendly to people. She was good at um, she was good at entering stuff into the computer. She really yeah. liked that. And so I think it was she said she's really happy that she had that experience because now she can put that on her application. Totally. And, I, I, mean, I think that um, totally counts. These 14, 15, 16 year old summers, you know, jobs are awesome and ideal in some ways. But there's there's other ways to, I guess, right, like you said, start to yeah. build a resume. And it's not the end of the world if you're listening to this and your 15 year old, you know, doesn't have a summer. Yeah. Job. And I feel like this, you know, too, like around the holiday this year, if she wanted to get a little quickie job like yeah. over the holiday season, she could. I feel like now she's got confidence yeah. that she could actually know what she's doing. And um, so that was great. And it was like it kind of did what it needed to do. Yeah, that's great. We are welcoming back our sponsor, Element. Element is a zero sugar electrolyte drink mix born from the growing body of research, revealing that we may be at our healthiest when we're getting more sodium than we think we need. Each stick packet delivers a significant dose of electrolytes without any artificial colors or other tricky ingredients. And I got to tell you, in addition to Element being super hydrating, Eric is obsessed with the salty taste. I have to say, I like the salty taste too. And you know, I am a headache sufferer. I'm prone to migraines. So I have to be really on top of my hydration. And I really lean on Element to help me do that. Element makes it easy to get the sodium, potassium, and magnesium we need quickly, and the packets are so convenient to have available anytime and anywhere. I can just toss a couple in my purse or fanny pack or keep some in the car. Listeners, you can try Element totally risk-free. If you don't like it, they'll refund your order, no questions asked. And we have a great deal just through our partnership. You can get a free Element sample pack, that's eight flavors, with any purchase at drinkelement.com slash momhour. Also, try the new Element Sparkling. That's a bold 16-ounce can of sparkling electrolyte water. Again, that's drinklmnt.com slash momhour. All right, Sarah. Well, the obvious question that needs to be asked, that must be addressed, is how was Europe? Oh, it was so great. So this is fun because I feel like I'm picking up kind of where we left off when we last recorded. We talked about our summers um, and I shared a little bit. So our family of five plus my parents, so seven of us, um, did two weeks in northern Italy and Switzerland. Um, and it it all the, when I talk about this, the first thing I want to say is it went so well logistically. And I know that's not the only measure of successful travel, because often the logistical bumps you hit along the road become funny stories and all of that. Having said that. I worked really hard on the planning of this trip and it was a a big investment in financially and time wise. So I'm just very grateful that we didn't have, say, like flight delays or weather yeah. issues or somebody I getting super sick. Rowing off exactly. your very hard work. Exactly. Yeah, and we would have plans. It would have been okay. We would have navigated it. So um, but I feel so grateful that we got to have the trip that I planned, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, We were about four days in far northwest Italy, really at the base of the Italian Alps. Like we went to we went up Mont Blanc. um, So the and we could see the Matterhorn. So really, really Alpine. It looks much more like what you would picture France or Switzerland than Italy. But we were in Italy. In fact, people in that village, more of them spoke French than Italian. We were that close to the French and the Swiss border. Um, and so that was really a very unique place. It is not a lot of place that tourists go when visiting Italy. It was really, really special. And then we went over to North East Italy, um, about an hour from Venice and an hour from Verona. Um, and it was warm there. It was got looks a little bit hotter, um, and probably more what you picture when you picture Italy. Um, we ate lots of pizza, ate lots of pasta, um, all through Italy we were driving. So we had two rental cars. Sometimes the seven of us would pile into one car because we we had a car that had an optional third row. (laughs) So 
Brian, my husband, who's a really good driver and a really, I mean, you know him, Megan, he's very unflappable. He doesn't get short tempered. He's hard to like, he's hard to stress out, honestly, which is why it makes, he makes such a good (laughs) counterpoint to me. Um, And he's also (laughs) a very good driver. He's a very competent driver. He's safe, but he's, um, he's not like aggressive, but those Italian, um, the autostrada, like the highways are intimidating. The drivers go really fast. Um, They come right up behind you. They zoom around you. There are tolls everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And the roads actually are beautiful. So shout out to the tolls are paying for some, the roads are really nice and they're generally well-marked. Like the highways are for the most part, like clean and well-marked, but you go through tolls constantly and they're quite expensive and they can get confusing. So I'm just, I share this just like, so you can picture like seven of us like barreling through Italy, crammed into a car, like, no, we got to do this toll. No, not this lane. That's cash only. And then also, I don't know if any, like anyone listening who's done the tolls in Italy, sometimes they just don't work. Like you, your card doesn't work or your ticket doesn't work or the cash thing doesn't work or it doesn't read the ticket that you just got printed at the last place. And we compared notes with other people and it, it's not just like tourist user error. Like they really sometimes just don't work. So there was lots of amusing um, Italy driving stories, but no, you know, mm-hmm. no, no worse for the wear. So it sounds like just, I want to talk about these tolls. Really yeah, yeah, yeah. The most exciting part of it. I know, trip, right? Obviously the Europe, but it sounds like they're still using like a, a manual or at least a paper based. It's not like the open road tolling like they have everywhere. So I think it, at a lot of places you here. could have, if you had the equivalent of like those fast pass scanners, like if you were a resident, you would probably have those, the sensor things that you put Got in your it. car and you just keep driving through. But as tourists, and there are a lot of tourists on these highways, yeah. um, you go through and you you take a ticket when you get on and then you put that same ticket in when you next exit the toll and then you pay. Um, but like I said, so you would think credit card would be the, the easiest, but half the time, like your card wouldn't read correctly or the ticket wouldn't read. And then you'd have to push a button and like talk to someone who doesn't speak English. It's just like comical. It was, it was comical. Very like so good. Ro- like Europe- you're doing a good job with the money on the roads, but maybe the tech is a little I think so. <laughs> yeah, a little outdated. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I say all that about the cars because one of the magical things about um, just the difference between Italy and Switzerland was that we ditched the rental cars. And then for the last five days of our trip, we we did um, train. We traveled by train only in Switzerland. And I, before I left, I had heard people kind of contrast, compare and contrast Italy and Switzerland in full complement of both cultures. Um, because this is not like one's better, one's worse, but they are so different. Um, And so being in Italy, which is like sort of chaotic and unpredictable and every region is so different and the people are so like passionate and friendly and Mm -hmm. outgoing. And then like you get to Switzerland and like everything works perfectly. Everything's on time, but everything's also a little (laughs) more like reserved. You, you yeah. often in Switzerland feel like you might be doing something wrong. And actually you, you sometimes feel that way in Italy too, especially as a tourist, but like in Italy, someone's probably just going to tell you you're doing it wrong and then like give you a hug or like give you a cookie yeah. or something in Switzerland. <laughs> you feel a little, um, a little judged because everything is so systematic, but Megan, it works perfectly. Our Airbnb, like well, had, don't go screwing it up. Right. Know? Exactly. Like there's right. a reason we do it. Like don't put your feet on the seats in the train. There's a reason that these trains look like they were born yesterday. Like everything looks pristine, but also there is a kind of, the people are slightly more reserved. They're very helpful. I remember texting this to you. It's not that they're unhelpful. They will give you exactly as much information as you require and it will be accurate. But there's like there's a sort of like an arm's lengthness about it. And I really like if you are listening and you are Swiss or Italian, I I like really have high regard for both cultures. It's just the contrast is so was so interesting. And I'm so glad that we had both those experiences. Everything from the people to the transportation. I wonder if they really stood out to you because they were so close, like one right after the other. Yeah, Yeah. totally. Totally. Yeah. So it was it was wonderful. Well, I loved the the photos that you sent, um, they were incredible and loved hearing about it. Very inspiring. And I love that, you know, I do think maybe there's a future for you as like a concierge travel 
planner. I'm not even going to say an agent because yeah. I don't think you care about booking flights and stuff, but more like, let me put together this curated experience for you. Yeah, I you really enjoyed totally that. I, I got so much satisfaction out of when the, the, the research I had done kind of paid off, you know, and um, I think, yeah, it was overall, it was it was a it was a big success. I would like to use those skills. I thought a lot about like, should I be writing about this? Should I be writing down tips? You know, you, you know, our content yeah. brains yeah. like they don't turn off. Um, and I wasn't. I mean, I took photos for our own enjoyment and I didn't blog or do anything like that. But we'll see. Um, I definitely have thoughts that more thoughts yeah. than could fill this six minutes of a podcast segment. So. Well, you're home now. And I know listeners often are curious what it's like to be home with teens and tweens in the summer. It's very different from yeah. smaller kids. And you're right in the thick of that. Like that is your life right now. Yeah. Yes. So tell us about that. Well, you know, I feel like for those, those for whom summer is such a challenge in terms of childcare and keeping kids busy, whether you're working outside the home or not, or a little bit of both, it's just, it is challenging. Camps are challenging. Finding childcare is challenging. Keeping bored kids not bored is challenging. And I just will say that it gets so much easier. Like the degree of easierness of my summer mom life this year. So my kids for anyone not keeping track at home are 11, 14 and 16. Um, the 16 year old has actually been at a summer program. So he hasn't even been home for a couple of weeks, but he will be the rest of the summer. But even when they were say um, 11, nine and six, not not even toddlers anymore, but just the amount of thinking and planning I had to do to to have a summer that felt fun for my kids, fun for me, like not tearing my hair out by the time school got going again. It's like night and day, Megan. So I guess, number one, I, I do want to give people that hope. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think about things like I'm going to go run these errands today. I don't have to think about loading kids into a hot right. car. I just leave them at home. Um, right. There are some things like video games and keeping them off devices for a reasonable amount of time and making sure that they are just like that. They are having a, a semi balanced summer life. I don't mean by that I, that they need to read an hour every day and work on their. I, I mean, I have a pretty relaxed definition of balance for a tween and teen in the summer, but I do want them to move their bodies. I do want them to eat some regular meals. I do want them to keep up with their household responsibilities. So it's not like I don't have to think about those things. I do. And actually what we have done for like gaming and screen time this summer so far since we've been home is I've just said we're having no electronics until 1 p.m. And then we're having kind of a free for all after 1 p.m. I mean, within reason, sometimes I pull them off. and I'm like, hey, guys, go do something else or we're going to go do something else. But that has felt so simple. And just a few years ago, that would have made me like crawl out of my skin to think of my kids from like 1 p.m. till bedtime that they could technically be on their screens that whole time. But anymore, they're not like we're right. we're doing things. Um, and, and that way in the morning, I just I can they're at my disposal. They can help me with stuff around the house. So I feel mostly pretty positive about tweens and teens at home in the summer. Talk to me in a month. We're purposely doing this like midway right. through the summer. I do think there will be a point where I'm just like, ew, this feels kind of gross. Like we're not doing very much, yes. but we did a lot in the first couple of weeks. So. Well, and it's, it's really helpful to remind ourselves. I think that a summer does not have to be like a big amorphous, like it doesn't have to be the same June, July, and August. Like right. it's not, yeah, you, point. you have three distinct months in a typical summer vacation. You have different seasons within the season. Yeah. And sometimes there's going to be the lay around like a slug season. And sometimes there's going to be like the, Hey, we're all haul and butt around Europe season or yeah. whatever, like the more active season. So right now you're in what they call bed rot. Yes. Season. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. You know, it's so funny as you were talking, I was thinking about the challenges I've had with kids in that age range, more of like the older teen range for me is when it started to look like this. And not even when my kids, not even when like just the oldest were teens, older teens, like with you and, you know, with Luke, but like mm -hmm. Now that the youngest are yeah. also older, two things can happen. One, my kids are not early risers. And if I let them, they would literally sleep till three or four o'clock yeah. in the afternoon. So the thing about that 
is if I get busy, you know, if I get up in the morning and they're not up yet and I go sit down at my computer and start hammering out some piece of writing, let's say, and I get really into it, I might look up and be like, oh my gosh, it's 1.30 and no one's up yet. Mm -hmm. So I've had to be a li like, I've had to have a different approach to the um, screens and stuff like that because that could actually use up my kids' entire right, right. waking day. So I've had to be a little more forceful about getting them moving kind of against their will, making like I, for myself, I have to yeah. set a time, like check in with them because otherwise if the well, house and is then so you, quiet. Then, then you end up on completely opposite yes, schedules. I'm glad you brought opposite. that up because we haven't dealt with that. Partly just my kids, um, natural body clocks. And also I am, I am removing their ability to do many fun things on their devices after a certain time in the evening. So they're not, I'm not saying your kids are up all night on theirs and yours are older, but um, mine tend to go to bed kind of early still. Cause they're like, they're just, they're just still young enough that their lives are kind of boring, but that is definitely a consideration. Yeah. And I'll find sometimes I'm like, you know, and my kids also leave to go to their dad yeah. sometimes or Clara goes to, she has a best friend that she does a sleepover with about once a week. So sometimes I'll literally be like, is there even anyone in the house? I don't even, it's so quiet. <laughs> is I, haven't, I haven't heard a toilet flush or a door shut. Am I alone in here? And so it's like, I have to always, I have to keep myself on a schedule to keep them on a mm -hmm, schedule. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, but you're right that it is 100% different than when I had even like, um, kids in that sort of eight to 14 year old range when the oldest is a teen, but the youngest are still young. Yeah. You still have a lot of those same legacy issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, say, you're, and yeah. you're still kind of running your house according to, to meet a kind of average of needs, probably yes. like a midpoint in the age yeah. range. Yeah. Well, so far I, the way this summer has broken up has felt logical because we did do such a big travel undertaking in the beginning that it feels it feels like natural that we would do kind of nothing for a couple of weeks and then I can tell we'll be ready to I don't know I don't know if it's going to be more structure or just a little more diversion we just haven't done we haven't taken advantage of our you know what's available to us in our hometown so there's plenty more summer uh, yet ahead Okay, well, as we were saying, this is probably like the midpoint in our summers. We, I have at least a month left. I'm not sure about you, Megan. So let's each share a little bit about what's still to come for our families this summer, what we're looking forward to. Yeah, so the one thing that's big on my horizon is Owen getting dropped off at college. It's very early. It's like uh, uh, August 16th, I think, is oh, his wow. move-in day. The reason they do that, and I think it's because the school is really far away from like everybody, right. it's not easy to get to by plane. So like no one's really local. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of people are driving a long way. So I think they're doing it so that all the kids get there, get dropped off all together. Like all the young people, not sure. children there, young adults get dropped off all at once. And then they have like all of their orientation and stuff happens that week. So a lot of colleges, you go to orientation a month before school oh, starts. Interesting. Um, I did Here, it it's Owen's like, way. Like that's how, yeah. that's how I experienced. We had, it was called new student week or it was like a whole week of orientation right before yeah. school started. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I think, you know, maybe it just makes sense if there's a school where a lot of, it's not necessarily like a, what do they call suitcase yeah. schools where, you know, yeah, it's like, this is a long way. So let's get you there and then, um, and then get you, get you in and get you all kind of like into the, into the mix, into the culture, all of that. So it's a little earlier than I was expecting. Um, but, and in fact, the funny thing is I accidentally scheduled the, my annual girl weekend with Jenna and Missy that weekend. Cause I just thought it was the following weekend in my Got mind. It. I was like, Oh, it's like August 22nd, right? Oh no, it's not. It's August 16th. <laughs> so we had to move that up. So that's always, that's coming too. So we're, um, Jenna, Missy and I are getting together a weekend in early August but then taking Owen to school is going to be a whole thing. It's, uh, it's quite a drive and it's in an area that I love to explore. So it turns out some friends that we met, um, the friends who are the other UP business owners that we met in Manistique mm -hmm. that we became friends with, their son is also going to Michigan Tech. Oh, no way. So oh we're getting, we're renting a house for the weekend and Fun. then we're, we'll have the kids with us for one night. And then they'll be at school and then we'll, the adults will hang out oh my gosh, up there what a fun for another night. Isn't that fun? Yeah, yeah. I love that. So, and, and, um, the other dad actually went to tech. So he has a whole bunch of experience up there. And so 
we're just going to have fun. And I, you know, I'm hoping maybe Eric and I can stay an extra day or two, even yeah. in the area and turn it into a little vacation because you know, as we're recording this, it's late in July and I'm realizing I didn't do anything fun this year. Like I haven't, I haven't gone camping. I yeah. haven't gone kayaking. Yeah. I haven't, Eric and I last night went to this little town that we go to a lot called South Haven. And I was like, we haven't been here all summer. We haven't been here all year. It's probably yeah. been a full year since we've been up there. Um, we don't just like, because there's been so much going on really since we got married, honestly, it's just been one thing after another. It's like running an Airbnb and then having a reception that we got to plan. And then like kids are in school and then starting a business and then, you know, uh, spinning that off into another business. And I'm writing a book like it's been so much. And it's often does work out that my summer is front loaded with busyness. I've found that that's kind of a thing that often happens. Like June is just kind of business as usual. It doesn't even look like summer yet. Then July, there's just a lot going on. And it's like end of July into August is when the fun stuff happens. Yeah. So I don't really have much planned. But you're going to pack am, it in. But I'm going to pack it in. And I just keep reminding myself, technically, it is summer till I think September 20th. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I have lots of time. Lots of time. Do you yeah. have. So the way we're recording this, we're recording this before your birthday. It will air after your birthday, but we can, we can ask, I can ask, do you have birthday plans? Do you know where you'll be? Uh, we'll be, no, we'll just be here. I, we don't have anything planned yet, but, um, we're not going anywhere. So the good news about that is that we can, um, I guess just wing it mm -hmm. because we don't have anything else that we're doing. Yeah. So, and yeah. my birthday falls on a Saturday this year, which is fun. It is. It is yeah. Fun. And Eric's birthday is, I think, Wednesday. His daughter will be here. And I always forget yeah, that you guys have very close together. Yeah. Buddy. So, yeah. So what about you? What is coming up for you the rest of the summer? <laughs> well, I'm sure it won't surprise you that this whole like Europe trip, it just was the thing I was planning. It was almost like life didn't exist after that. I was like, I don't I don't know what we're doing with our summer after right. that. And so far that it has kind of been how it's been. Um, but a few things that are going to change that'll shake up the family dynamic. Um, so Luke has been studying at a university across the country. And as we record is uh, flying home by himself today. So we're going to get back a kid who's not been in the house for three weeks. So that will kind of reshuffle the the family rhythms. Um, and then Violet is going to fly on her own up to hang out with my parents in Oregon. Um, That's a the, big deal. You know, know. this yeah. is actually the first time any of my kids have flown by themselves is Luke, which, and he's 16, but then right. the next time is like in a week and a half and it's Violet and she's 11. So this is, I, I never did it at that age and none of my kids have. Um, Brian actually grew up flying with his sister because their parents divorced and lived in different cities. So he actually flew a lot as a, as a kid, um, like as an unaccompanied minor. So Violet's very, well, they're both excited, but Luke is excited in the way that like he wants to blend in as an adult, like no help. I'll do this on my own. Whereas Violet is very excited to like be the unaccompanied minor right. and like yeah. get slightly special treatment. And so, um, so we're kind of swapping around where kids are a little bit. Um, and then we are going up to central Oregon just for a few days for a family reunion on my mom's side. Um, at the beginning of August, we did that last year. Actually, last year we drove. It's a really fun road trip, but we just don't have the time off of work and stuff this this year. So we are flying. Um, and so that will kind of break up the very beginning of August. Not break it up, but that, that will be something to kind of pin on the calendar for early August. And then I feel like when we come home, it'll be the home stretch. So um, I like you, I feel like I haven't done any of the summer fun things that are available to me just in regular life going, sitting outside on a patio, going to the beach, um, you know, all, all the things that my town has to offer. So I think that's just what I'm looking forward to is like kind of embracing summer lifestyle in my own hometown, which is often what happens when you travel, right? You kind of appreciate right. being home. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love it. And, and again, it's like, we have time, we have some, we have time. Yeah. So well, and we are back on the podcast. So you and I will be talking more. We'll be recording more. So let's talk about what's coming up on the podcast. Um, on Friday, we're going to replay an episode from the archives called How to Be a Good Enough Lunch Packer. So if you out there listening are one of those early August uh, back to school types and you are ready to think like a lunch packing mom, 
this episode is for you. And if you are not there yet, you just come back to that in September. But it's a really good episode from back when you and I, Megan, were packing like many lunches every day. So it's full of tips that'll be in your feed on Friday. Is that nice? We can offer advice from our past selves. From our past. We don't even have to remember what it was like. Exactly. We'll be at the beach with our teenagers while uh, past Megan and Sarah talking about packing elementary school lunches. Um, And then a week from today, next Tuesday, I'm excited. You and I are going to be talking about friendships in motherhood. And it is a continuation of a conversation that Jamie and Katie Goldner started um, back in July when we were off. Um, And so you'll see a Friendships in Motherhood Part 1 on July 16th. It aired, and we are going to kind of continue that conversation and talk about the landscape of our mom friendships um, now that we have older kids. So I would definitely recommend going back and listening to Part 1 because we're going to kind of pick up the thread, and that will air a week from today. So, Megan, I will talk to you then. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to The Mom Hour. Everything we talked about in today's episode is available at themomhour.com. And hey, while you're there, you can find more than 500 podcast episodes, plus articles, playlists, and resources about motherhood and parenting at every stage. And if you like today's episode, we'd love it if you would take a minute to share the show with another mom in your life. You can also find us on Instagram at The Mom Hour, chatting and interacting with listeners between episodes. Thanks for being here, friends. We'll talk to you soon. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20%. Sarah, my new solo podcast, The Tease Made, is still going strong. I've got dozens of episodes published on topics like wellness, self-care rituals, caring for your home, creativity, herbal medicine, movement, all my kitchen adventures, and of course, tea. Well, of course. Yes, I love The Tease Made. It's such a fun peek into everything that's going on in your home and your life. And I just love the cozy vibe. Plus, I think a solo podcast can be such a nice contrast to interview shows or two host shows like ours. There's just something so calm about hearing one person talking to you for a little while about whatever's going on with them. Well, that makes me happy to hear because that is my intention. The Tease Made is your chance to step out of the busyness of everyday life and find calm and connection through cozy conversations. Just look for The Tease Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts.